Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is our next short paper on non-human immorality and non-human sin. Um, Helen's presenting. Um, we'll go for about 20 minutes presentation, and I'll, I'll wave frantically at you when you've got five minutes um, to go, um, and then about 10 minutes Q&A. So, um, over to you. Thank you. Classical definitions of sin mostly assume that sin is an exclusively human phenomenon. Okay. Some thinkers, such as Zwingli and Kant, define sin by inextricably tying it to humanity. Other thinkers do not include humanity so explicitly in their definitions of sin, and so open the possibility for the inclusion of non-human creatures within their definitions. The definitions of sin provided by Augustine, Origen, Aquinas, Barth, and Schleiermacher can include non-human creatures within them, but not without considerable examination of their positions. Even then, that such work is necessary to read the possibility of non-human sin in their definitions indicates that it was not their intention for their definitions to apply to any species other than humanity. <laughs> the human exclusivity of sin is not universal, however. Some theologians, including myself, argue that non-human sin is possible and real. Such discussions focus on actual rather than original sin, and my discussion here is no different. Whether non-human creatures have or are affected by original sin is a discussion requiring much more work than I have space for here, and I would argue that it is unnecessary if one merely wishes to establish the possibility of non-human sin. If it is possible for non-human creatures to actually sin, then non-human sin is possible whether or not human cre non-human creatures have or are affected by original sin. The focus on the possibility of non-human actual sin is often tied to discussions of the possibility of non-human immorality. If non-human creatures are amoral, as it is often assumed, then non-human creatures cannot sin. This link between sinful actions and immoral actions is, I believe, not only unnecessary, but inaccurate. I will argue that sin and immorality are separate categories from one another, and that non-human creatures can be sinful even if they are amoral. Furthermore, understanding this distinction between sin and immorality makes it easier for the theologian to accept the possibility of non-human sin. And I'm hoping to develop this into a longer article, so your feedback on this work would be much appreciated. One theologian who argues for the possibility of sin is David Clough. He's not on the screen right now. <laughs> His empirical evidence for this possibility draws from primatology, and particularly Sarah Hardy's ethnology of chimpanzee infanticide and cannibalism. Infanticidal and cannibalistic chimpanzees are sinning, Clough says, because these are, quote, not merely actions forced by instinct or emotion. These actions remain sinful for Clough, even if, as Hardy has argued, infanticide and cannibalism can be, at least for some species of non-human primates, evolutionarily beneficial. It is unclear, however, why any evolutionary beneficial behaviours should be regarded as sinful, as morally uncomfortable as such behaviours may make human observers. Clough argues that these behaviours are sinful because they are not purely emotional or instinctual, thus implying that the chimpanzees in Hardy's study could have not slain and consumed the children of other chimpanzees. The sinful nature of these actions lies in their actors' ability to do otherwise. In a human context, we can easily understand how infanticide and cannibalism are sinful. In a chimpanzee context, this clarity is not so apparent. Clough argues that were humans to commit infanticide and cannibalism, they would rightly be condemned by their fellow humans. The legalistic retribution a child killer and cannibal faces, says Clough, indicates that non-human primates who kill non-human primate children and consume the flesh of other non-human primates who are members of the same species as them should receive similar condemnation. But why? Legality is an arguably human construct and the laws of human society do not easily translate to the non-human. That which is illegal in human society, and laws are by no means universal, is not necessarily sinful, though there are many overlaps. We can understand murder as sinful, biblically mandated as such as it is, 
but it is less obvious that all illegal activities are sinful. For example, in the UK, it is illegal to knock on someone's front door and run away before they have opened the door, and it has been since 1839. This is certainly an act of nuisance, but would we consider it to be a sin? It makes logical sense that certain things would be sinful for one species but not for another, considering the differences in evolutionary strategies between species. But we run the risk of arbitrariness and possible speciesism when deciding what counts as a sin for one species and not for another. One could of course say that it is not up to us to determine what is sinful for each species. God knows when any creature is sinning or not, even if humans determine certain non-human behaviour to be sinful which is not, or others to be sinful even though it is. Humans need only concern themselves with human sin, and not worry about whether the infanticidal cannibalistic chimpanzee is sinning. These murky waters are for those concerned with individual behaviours. I wish to look at the bigger picture, a more conceptual and less empirical picture of what it means for non-human creatures to be capable of sin. Scholarly treatments of sin, both original and actual sin, are mutually inconsistent regarding the relationship between sinful and immoral actions. Zwingli identifies sinful actions as those which transgress moral law. Kant's definition of sin is tied inextricably with his discussion of moral law. For both these thinkers, there is a direct and unbreakable connection between sinfulness and immorality. Augustine, however, describes original sin as be being alienated from God, and actual sin as individual actions which are indicative of this alienation, and which potentially alienate the sinner still further from God. Origin defines sin as the error of turning from God, though admits this error is a moral one. Aquinas defines sin as the privation of original justice, which is itself a divine gift to the primordial couple and transmitted to their offspring. Barr argues that sin is unbelief in Christ and thus a rejection of God in Christ. Schleiermacher also holds that sin is an exclusively theological concept, sin being in his thought the arresting of the God consciousness, to the extent that those lacking God consciousness cannot sin, presumably no matter what immoral actions they do. For these five scholars, sin is necessarily a theological concept, inexplicable without reference to God. This latter conviction is shared by many modern scholars who agree that the language of sin is diminished, if not rendered meaningless, when divorced from theological language. Alastair McFadden, for instance, argues that it is impossible to reduce sin to moral language, and that to do so conflicts with the description of sin given in the Hebrew Bible. Ian A. McFarland, too, identifies sin as, quote, an overarching term for human resistance to or turning away from God. George Hunsinger, while believing that sin is a mystery we will never properly understand, describes two kinds of sin, sin against God, which he calls vertical sin, and sin against other humans, which he calls horizontal sin. He argues that all sin is vertical, but some sin is also horizontal. There is no sin which is not a sin against God, even if it is also a sin against other humans. He maintains, however, that sin is a theological category and not a moral one. David H. Kelsey agrees, arguing that, quote, whatever its further ramifications may be, sin is a theological notion defined theocentrically and cannot simply be interchanged without remainder with, with psychological, sociological or cosmological notions. There is then a prevailing view in theological discourse that sin is an explicitly theological concept. Sin is, broadly speaking across these definitions, something which negatively affects the sinner's relationship with God. This contrasts with immorality, which can be sensibly discussed without any use of theological language in a way which is impossible in discussions of sin. Sin and immorality are therefore different things. Similar, though not identical, to Huntsinger's distinction between vertical and horizontal sin, I argue that there are sinful actions which are not immoral. It is for this reason that the religious hermit can still be a sinner, despite being isolated from social relationships with non-divine parties. There are two main reasons that non-human sin has often been considered impossible in Christian tradition. First, that non-human creatures cannot sin because they are amoral, Second, that non-human creatures lack the theological possibility to sin. 
In my PhD, I challenged the second, arguing that non-human creatures are theologically equal to human creatures, which in turn opens the possibility for non-human sin. In this paper, I have challenged the first, arguing that while non-human creatures may be amoral, the reality of this is a discussion for another time, this does not prevent them from being able to sin. Sin and immorality are different categories, despite their many overlaps in the human context. To equate sin with immorality is a category error, one which unnecessarily prevents our acceptance of the possibility of non-human sin. Thank you. Um, I shall open it to two questions. If I can remind you to speak loudly so the mic picks you up, that would be awesome. Anyone got any questions? Yeah. So thank you so much for a fascinating paper. Um, could, could you give an example, perhaps, of a non-human sinful action? Because I can understand if you define sin in terms of alienation from God, then, then you can uh, get animals into the definition. But as soon as you are going to extrapolate from that to sinful actions, I, would, I was wondering whether you could, could give an example of a non-human action which is perhaps amoral but yet sinful yeah that's um that's a that's a really interesting question thank you um the example that i give in the chapter that i kind of talk about this a bit more uh, in more detail um is that of the serpent in the garden um which Obviously, there's a, there's a lot of tradition which uh, equates the serpent in the garden with Satan or a demon or some that kind of uh, tradition. Um, but uh, I follow a lot more in David Clough's kind of footsteps, saying that you know there's a there's a reason why the serpent is a serpent is a non-human animal, um, and that part of that reason is because it is indicative of a non-human animal. <clears throat> sinning basically going against what god wants um and i use that as an example of this uh because the serpent in that context um is basically damaging another relationship um they are saying to the the humans oh if you if you do this you'll be closer to god when actually you'll be the, the result is that they are further from god um, so it, and they, and it knows that the serpent knows that that's the case. Um, so that kind of, uh, willful disruption of another creature's relationship with God, um, is, I argue, uh, a sin. Um, it's not necessarily, uh, moral, um, or immoral action, uh, because the, the serpent is acting in accordance with its nature. We're told that it's wily, it's crafty, that that's the kind of thing that it would do. Um, so in that, in that kind of sense, it's not necessarily an immoral action, um, because that's just, that's just what snakes are like, um, according to the text. Uh, but in terms of willfully disrupting, um, the relationship between another creature and God, uh, I would say that that, that is sinful. Can I come back just for yeah. a minute? Yeah. So thank you for that, that's a, that's a fabulous example. Yet I wonder whether that doesn't require a reading of Genesis 3, which is more literalistic than many scholars would uh, be, find warranted. So you seem to take the story quite literally in that case. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can understand that. Um, I'm not trying to argue that it's uh, kind of historically historically accurate in any way that, 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 that this actually happened in the history of the, the planet. Um, but I do think that um, the, the Hebrew Bible is written in a very particular way, that everything is, is there for a reason. Um, and that the theological uh, implications of how the Hebrew Bible has been written, the kind of things that have been included, the kind of things that haven't been included, um, are incredibly important for our theological understanding of the worldview 
that the text is trying to put forward. Um, so yeah, I would think that um, it is a it is an allegorical text. Uh, it, it's an ahistorical text, but it is still very much uh, telling us something very important um, about relationships between God, creation, creatures, non-human and human, um, because it, the serpent very well could have been not a non-human animal. Um, and yeah, it's, I think it's, it's very important to, to note that, that, that he is a serpent for a reason um, and that, that that means something. Thank you, that's very helpful. Any other questions? Uh, I would like to. Do you hear me? Yeah? Do you hear me? I, I think probably. Just speak. about. So, shall we come close? Yeah, it's the mics are in the ceiling, so you kind of like talk. Oh, okay, I see. No, I would like just to say um, have you reflected on the fact that uh, in Genesis, uh, after the fall, uh, you know, God. Uh, wishes bad things to the serpent uh, after what has happened. In a way, it seems to, to me, it's almost punishing the serpent. So are there implications there about understanding sin in, uh, uh, in the non-human world? Has, has that been reflected by, has this topic been, been taken in consideration by theologians? The punishment of the serpent? Not that much. Um, I mean, I I think, uh, and you know, this is kind of following on from, from what I was saying before um, to the previous questions, that um, the way that the text is written is, see, it seems to be indicative that the serpent did indeed sin in that case. Um, because, you know, if we, if we say, oh, we can tell that the humans are si have si sinned because they're punished, then we have to say that, well, the serpent sinned because he is also punished. Um, but it hasn't, at least in terms of what I've encountered in the literature and things like that, um, it hasn't been touched on that much I think the the only kind of like explicit um reference to what this might mean for non-human animals is in David Clough because I think the, there's still a lot of prevalence of um the kind of Milton tradition of the the serpent is Satan um and n a less kind of focus on the serpent is a non-human animal, and that might mean something slightly different than what the, the kind of Milton tradition indicates. Um, yeah, thank yeah. you. Any other questions? Go for it. Hi, thank you so much. Really, really interesting paper, and I think it's given us all a lot to think about. And I'm really interested in this connection that you drew out between uh, morality or amorality or immorality and acting according to one's nature. Um, I, if I've understood you correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you're kind of saying that if a non-human animal is acting according to its nature, then something that we perceive as being immoral um, would be, it's just, it's just what that animal was built to do. Um, I wondered whether you could talk a little more about two things. Firstly, with your example of the snake in the garden, how do we know that it was in the nature of the snake as a species to be cunning, and it wasn't just this particular snake in the garden was cunning, um, which might open up more capacity for its immorality within its species? Um, and then secondly, how do you see that relating to human nature if, if humans, by nature, might be uh, cunning or cruel or evolutionary, certain evolutionary perspectives um, advantageous for humans uh, might, might suggest that we, by nature, have capacity for things which our moral frameworks seem to be uh, wrong. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I think there's a there's there's a few things uh, going on there. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons that I'm particularly drawn to this idea of divorcing um, human ideas and morality from other species and looking at kind of species specific ways of being moral um, is mainly because of predation. Uh, so I, I want to avoid saying that predation is immoral and I definitely want to avoid saying that it's sinful um, because uh well we, we saw it yesterday there was a in um in the keynote yesterday there was a, a lot of um talk about you know god is being portrayed as a lion and things like that and um when we kind of say that predation is is sinful or immoral we're basically saying that predatory animals are wrong in how they are alive um which doesn't seem to accord with uh how predatory animals are, are talked about in certain passages of the hebrew bible for example um just how we view you know m many classical doctrines of creation that, that, that it is a diverse thing um including predate predatory animals prey animals so that's that's kind of why i wanted to really tease those two apart from each other uh, because I really didn't want to say that that predation is sinful. Um, in terms of the snake, um, that is actually a really interesting point that I hadn't considered that uh, there is, there's this kind of difference between um, all snakes and that snake in particular. Um, and I think uh, the reason that I kind of missed that is because in my PhD I'm working with a a, pro, a concept called pansyntheism which was developed by Ruth Page um, which is very much looking at both how God relates to a species and how God relates to particular individual animals so I think uh, what happened there is that I was just kind of assuming the knowledge of that um without without explicitly kind of saying that there is that difference between the individual and the species so yeah i think there there is possibly um that that difference between you know what what might be a sin for one individual might not be a sin for a, a different individual depending on how it relates to how one's relationship with god how how all that happens um obviously although there will be a lot of overlaps and commonalities. Uh, I think there's probably not a lot of examples where a sin is like just like it's only sinful for that one person um, or one creature. Uh, but in terms of the snake, I think, yeah, it is. We only have what that snake is like to go on. Um, so that's really all we can say. We can't say that it applies to all snakes. Um, but I would say that that doesn't really matter because it, it, it definitely applies to that snake. Um, in terms of the human na human nature being capable of sin or even... This is something I've been struggling with quite a lot, actually, um, because... And I, I don't have an answer yet, I'm afraid to say, because I think about, you know, like I said, I don't want predation to be sinful, um, but then you think about um, kind of classic stories of like crime and stuff, uh, and you think, you know, well, is that who that person is? Um, and whether that action or actions that they did um, would actually, in my framework, be considered not sinful or not immoral because that's just who they are and applying it across both and yeah that is that is genuinely something I have been struggling with quite a lot um and I've kind of been avoiding the issue because I'm not looking at humans um but uh yeah it no it is it is a something 
definitely to think about, but I'm afraid I don't have an answer for you on that one at this stage. Um, thank you very much. It's all really helpful. Thanks. Um, does anyone have any other questions? We've got time for a final question. Okay, and that says thank you ever so much, Anne. It's been a brilliant presentation, really clearly done. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.